Hi. Uh, thank you for coming today. I know uh, we all have busy schedules during the week, so uh, thank you for taking time out. My name is Andrew Xiao. Thank you, Amy, for the kind words. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, staying active with uh, shoulder pain. I feel like I'm the opening act because the main star tonight is the Rosa, which is primarily for hip and knee. But uh, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about shoulder pain, which is less common but important as we try to stay active. I'm going to start off with a show that I grew up watching. Um, they don't make quality family shows like this anymore. But if you remember Ed O'Neill, who is kind of known more for Modern Family, uh, Al Bundy was this disgruntled, unhappy woman's shoe salesman. And um, everything about his life was terrible. He had no joy. His, wom his uh, Peggy Bundy wanted to have a uh, little lovemaking, and even that wasn't good enough. His kids were, you know, mischievous. So on occasion, he would be able to reminisce about his old days when he was a star running back. And in those times, he was able to talk about that great game where he scored four touchdowns. Uh, and it was the only time you ever saw him smile on all the shows. Um, some of us can relate to this because uh, in our younger days, we were more slim, we were more fit, and we, we were able to do a lot more. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know some of the things that happen when you're a little bit older and shoulder pain is a little bit more common. The reality is that we all know that exercise is more common. and I mean, exercise is important to maintain your health. About uh, only 11% of the population exercises only two times a week. And the goals are a little bit different. You know, when you're younger, you're trying to impress the opposite sex, you're trying to stay fit. But <laughs> when you're older, you're trying to treat and prevent disease. You're trying to avoid injury. You're trying to live a little bit longer. Um, in the marathon, seen, uh, it, it has been identified that um, the older population has, is participating more and the population has been increasing, especially in the older side above 65. So in 2030, it's estimated that um, the over 65 population will be about 20%. Currently, it sits at about 15%. Those numbers are a little bit different with COVID, but that just gives you the general idea of what's happening in the future. So turning our attention back to the shoulder, it is one of the more interesting joints because it has the greatest mobility. So in a lot of the sports we watch, a lot of the performance is based on how well your shoulder functions. Uh, the challenge is that it's certainly subject to a higher risk of injury. The shoulder is not as simple as a ball and socket. When you look at the traditional joint, you may think more of like the hip where the ball is round, the socket is deep, and that confers stability. But when you look at the shoulder, it is more like a golf ball on a tee where the T is more narrow, it has a flatter surface, and the stability is more dependent on soft tissue in the front and the back. So today I'm gonna to talk about the six most common things I see in my practice in adults. And I'm gonna, I was supposed to give this lecture in 15 minutes and it's usually eight hours. But <laughs> here we go. The, the, the most common one I see is shoulder tendonitis, which is often per, uh, known as bursitis, impingement, rotator cuff tendonitis, um, and then on a more severe level, rotator cuff tear, and then arthritis followed by trauma which, in which you'll see fracture or instability with dislocation. And then finally, adhesive capsulitis, which can be seen more commonly in females. First, I'll touch a little bit upon anatomy. When you look at the shoulder, it's more of a sus suspensory complex. To the left, you'll see the humerus with the glenohumeral joint. Uh, the scapula is where the glenoid sits, which is the socket. Uh, curving up to the top on the roof is the acromion and then connecting the shoulder complex to the chest is the clavicle. There are 18 muscles that attach to the uh, shoulder complex, and this is a common question we ask the medical students, but uh, the main ones we would like to focus on are the deltoid and then the rotator cuff, which includes four muscles. Uh, the rotator cuff is responsible for pulling the shoulder joint toward the socket and then also providing a downward force. The deltoid also provides an upward force to kind of balance out. And so that's why the shoulder is unique because it has so many muscles that have to kind of sit and balance to pro work uh, properly. When we look at the first problem, which is shoulder impingement, uh, this is probably the, the most common thing I see above the age of 30. And this is a, a problem where it's usually insidious. You don't really identify any specific trauma, but you start noticing pain with overhead activity. There's pain in the front and more on the side. And then when you're, you're sleeping at night, it's hard to sleep on that side. 
When you look at the diagram to the left, you'll look at, um, you'll see that the rotator cuff is intact, but then the, the channel in which the rotator cuff is supposed to slide through is limited. Over the top, there's this bursa layer, which is supposed to be this lubricating fluid that's supposed to provide uh, a frictionless surface, but when it gets inflamed, it gets, in, it gets red and hot, and then it rubs against the acromion bone right above it, so the roof is starting to pinch against the bone. The deltoid is fine, but what happens is that friction causes pain with overhead activity, and then when you sleep at night, you don't have gravity pulling your arm down, and then the upward motion of your shoulder starts pinching against the bone, and it's hard to sleep on that side. The treatment options include anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, um, sometimes we consider injections of cortisone, and nowadays we also talk about biologic injections like platelet-rich plasma or stem cells. And then finally, if we need to, we'll do surgery in which we clean it out. Most of the time it can be done arthroscopically. <clears throat> Excuse me. We uh, put a camera through the back of the shoulder, and then through the anterior portal as well as the lateral portal, we'll take a look inside. Uh, these are some diagrams or some depictions of what we see inside. So that what you see on the left is the bony roof of the acromion, and the metal thing is the burr or a dremel, which we kind of shave away the bone. We clean it away, create more space in the subacromial space, uh, kind of like this diagram right here. Now the next more severe injury that we typically see is a rotator cuff tear. Now I see this as a concern for a lot of patients when they come in. Um, if you're under the age of 40, it is just not as common. Now it does happen. I'm sorry, if you're under the age of 60. It's just not as common unless there's trauma related to it. Usually you have to fall off a scaffold. You fall off a bike or you swing your golf club and you feel something rip. That is more convincing, but a lot of times it's uh, not necessarily as common under the age of 60. If you work in constru construction or have a manual job where something traumatic happened, then it might be uh, more realistic. Now above the age of 60, it can happen more insidiously. Trauma can happen, but Sometimes your genetics are such that the blood supply is compromised so that over time it starts to peel away and that's more of a degenerative tear of the rotator cuff. The treatment options are very similar to impingement where you think about physical therapy, you take anti-inflammatories, um, you consider a cortisone injection if you feel like the timing of surgery doesn't make sense, um, and then surgery. So again, it can be done arthroscopically. There are a number of implants out there that we have access to. Uh, they are, uh, the implants are designed out of biocomposite material. They can be metal, they can be uh, plastic, and then the suture is usually the, some synthetic suture that can hold up to 50 pounds. So the implants themselves are not usually the problem for why these fail. Sometimes it's the bone quality, sometimes it's the tissue quality. When I do surgery, I usually do like a 16 point check like a mechanic does. You put a camera inside, you look inside the joint, you look at the cartilage. So on the picture that you see on the left, you see the humeral head which is a cartilage. Uh, there you can see the glenoid, how it's a flatter surface. Around the edge is the labrum, which is kind of like a rubber gasket around it. And then above that is the biceps tendon. Above the biceps is the rotator cuff, which in other views you can see and visualize the tear. So here you can see a two centimeter tear, and inside that dark tunnel you can see the cartilage covering the humeral head, and then the pink and yellow stuff is the bone, where we need to reattach the rotator cuff. Um, and to the picture to the right is kind of the final picture after you've placed implants into the bone and the sutures are used to repair the rotator cuff. So in some cases, the rotator cuff is not necessarily of good quality. Um, on the picture to the left, we use biologic uh, augments and sometimes I can pull something over to repair arthroscopically, but it's just very thin. And so uh, there are augments where we can place a thin sheath of tissue. It is made out of collagen. Um, there's one product called Virgentin, which is a uh, cow-derived uh, Achilles tendon, which we put over and tack down. And the uh, microscopic studies that they've done on it shows that it thickens the tendon and helps repair uh, the rotator cuff. And then on the picture of the right, that's an example of what we call a superior capsular reconstruction. And that's where the rotator cuff is retracted, it's not mobile, it does not pull over. And you just have this big gaping hole over your humeral head where you have a sunroof. And so we use this human cadaver skin to cover the rotator cuff and the humeral head and attach it to the adjacent rotator cuff around there. And that is a, a nice salvage procedure to give you some function and address pain. Moving on to arthritis. Uh, it's also known as uh, degenerative disease. Uh, it's not as common as knee and hip arthritis. I think uh, when you talk about 
shoulder replacements. It only represents about 10% of arthroplasty procedures. Um, usually it's related to environmental factors. You have a history of being a heavy weightlifter, football. Uh, you work in a manual labor type job where you do construction. Now, genetics can also play a role, and sometimes that's important in the history. Uh, just to give you an example, on the left side, that's a normal shoulders. It's very round. There's about three to four millimeters of space uh, between the joint. When you look at the picture on the right, the joint space is much more narrow. Uh, there are bone, bone spurs down below called osteophytes. And because of the bone spurs, it's not so round. It's more of a flattened surface. Uh, there are different ways that our shoulder arthritis can present. Uh, on, again, on the left side, the uh, x-ray is normal, and then when you look at the middle picture, the head is flattened. When you look at the joint space, it's narrow, there's a bone spur down below, and then when you look at the quality of the bone, there's more sclerosis right there. When you look at the picture to the right, again, it's arthritic, but then the difference is that you see that the humeral head has kind of risen up, and in that case, you not only have arthritis, but you also have a rotator cuff tear, which is a bigger problem. So on occasion, if you have to put a camera inside, this is not common, um, you'll see how the cartilage is gone. The yellow that you see is basically exposed bone and the white fluffy stuff is the remaining cartilage. So this is a very irregular surface, so that's why you hear this sensation of crepitus, which is the grinding sound inside your shoulder. The treatment options, we start conservative, again, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, occasionally injections, but if it, if it comes to the point where all of that is not working, then we start looking at shoulder replacements. This is a, called an anatomic shoulder replacement where we cut off the humeral head where it's uh, diseased, and then we replace it with a metal head. And then on the socket side, we shave it away and then place a plastic piece, um, and the rotator cuff is intact. That is one of the requirements for uh, a successful total shoulder arthroplasty. Here you see a, an example of a reverse shoulder arthroplasty where the implant is uh, slightly different. On the humeral side, we put the socket, and then on the scapular side, where the glenoid usually is, we put uh, the ball. And this uh, is used in cases where the rotator cuff is gone, and uh, also in cases of severe fractures. This is designed so that it is more stable and able to stay centered on the joint while it functions. And because you have no rotator cuff, the deltoid does all the work. One of the things we do at uh, PIH and offer, and this is kind of alluding to what Rosa is as well, is computer-assisted surgery. Uh, I use a system called Blueprint occasionally, and this is where I look at cases where there's a lot of deformity, and it's a little bit harder to plan the surgery on the spot without knowing exactly where the bone is worn out. So this is, is a system where you can get uh, CT scans, to make a 3D image of the uh, bone, and then start planning based on size and positioning on what best fits the patient. So this is an example of where on the computer we've already taken the CT scan and you see the 3D image and then from there we start sizing it and then we take a good look at where all the bone wear is and then we can start placing the implant exactly where we want and know exactly what we want to do when we do it in surgery. Sometimes the deformity is so bad that it's hard to figure out where to put the implant um, without a guide and so you can make custom sized uh, implants or uh, for guides to place the guide wire and then from there ream away and then place the implant in the, in the appropriate position. So one of the case studies, um, this is a patient I did about three months ago, 66 year old male, uh, left shoulder pain times two years. He you know, has a standard pain with uh, night sleeping, pain with overhead activity, limited range of motion, uh, progressive stiffness and the crepitus sound. He worked as a contractor when he was younger. He still likes to work out uh, and bike. So these were his x-rays, so on the x-rays to the left, I mean, uh, to the right, yeah, to the left, you'll see that the joint space is much more narrow. Uh, there's bone spurs down below. It's no longer round. Um, and then the 3D images uh, that were, re re were reconstructed by radiology are on the right. Here are some of the preoperative planning uh, images, and you'll see that uh, on the upper right that the glenoid or the socket it has a lot of wear in the backside. So when we put the plastic implant, it has a, a bigger offset in the backside to kind of counter that where and then it allows us to put it in the right position. So here's a post-operative x-ray showing how he's doing and you know he has pain relief as well as good range of motion. Now if you have the unfortunate incident of having a fall and you sustain a shoulder fracture, this is another big cause of pain and in some cases you can avoid surgery and let it heal and do uh, physical therapy. Uh, but in more complex cases where there's uh, fracture, fragmentation and it requires something surgical to give you optimal function, 
There are a lot of ways we can address this. You know, sometimes it only requires a plate and screws. Other times it requires a hemiarthroplasty where you uh, take out the existing ball and then replace it with a metal ball, maintain the rotator cuff. And then on the right picture, you'll see a, an, another example of a reverse shoulder arthroplasty in which the ball and socket are flipped, kind of like the one I showed before. This is a slightly different design, so um, that's why it looks a little bit different. Um, in other trauma, you can sustain a shoulder dislocation. This is more common um, when out the front, and this is uh, mostly in the throwing position, so if you were to fall and throw your arm out, that's essentially the same thing. Um, we've, I've encountered dislocations when you slide into base or for younger patients, uh, but generally your arm is in the abducted or externally rotated position when it does happen. And it's usually an injury to the front of the labrum, which is the rubber gasket at the front of the glenoid. So when you look at this picture, uh, the glenoid is right here, looking at it from the side, and the front part of the shoulder is here, and the back part of the shoulder is here. The labrum is the rubber gasket they see around. Uh, usually we can try physical therapy, especially in older patients, to see how they do. Uh, but if there is a tear that leads to recurrent instability, then we will treat this arthroscopically. So we'll take the front labrum, and then with a camera as well as implants, we'll start placing anchors in the front edge of the glenoid, followed by placement of uh, these anchors that are usually designed out of metal, plastic, or biocomposite material, uh, and wrapping it around to reattach it to the glenoid. So here's a, an example of an arthroscopic picture. So you'll see the bumper or the labrum in the front. This is the humeral head of the cartilage, I mean of the, uh, the cartilage of the humeral head, and then the front part of the glenoid is this, so this recreates the bumper and the soft tissue restraint from dislocating. And the last thing I'll talk about is frozen shoulder. This can often present as uh, shoulder tendonitis initially. It's more common in females. Um, usually it's insidious, and there isn't a really a cause of why it happens. If you have a history of diabetes or thyroid disease, you're at higher risk. But beyond tendonitis, which is usually identified as pain and decreased uh, mobility, you'll start to notice a loss of active and passive range of motion. So it, for some reason, it tends to happen more in females and usually on the left side. The uh, treatment options are uh, much like what you've seen already th four times already. So physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, uh, manipulation under anesthesia is considered if you know, things are not working out. We do uh, injection of cortisone to help to calm the inflammation and shrink uh, the uh, inflamed capsule. One of the things I forgot to mention was that what's happening in frozen shoulder is that the capsule is usually this elastic, you know, contained uh, liner that's supposed to help your shoulders to maintain uh, flexibility, but in adhesive capsulitis, this capsule becomes inflamed, swollen, and starts to shrink, and that's why you lose range of motion. So that's why a manipulation under anesthesia will break that tissue, or even surgery to cut that tissue and, and improve your range of motion. So I kind of ran through a bunch of uh, shoulder problems. Uh, in the end, Hopefully none of you have this, um, but you know, in terms of what we can do to prevent this, you know, all the principles are what you're probably familiar with, and I'll kind of run through that as well. So when you're reactive, you want to stretch initially. Um, I think it's important to get the blood flowing through your shoulder, do a couple of jumping jacks, and specifically for the shoulder, you know, move around to you know, improve your mobility. You know, strengthening is important. Um, your goal is not necessarily to work on increasing muscle mass. I think uh, you're more supposed to do uh, high reps and low weights to um, prevent injury. I think when, by strengthening, you also improve your reflexes. So when you're uh, in the unfortunate incident of actually falling, you're able to catch yourself. When I also talk about strengthening with my patients, I also discuss core strengthening as well as improving your lower back, which is a foundation for, you know, uh, transmitting energy to your shoulders, so that's very important. Um, protective gear is important. There aren't a lot of sports where shoulder pads are that important, but I think elbow and knee pads for certain sports are important. Um, setting your limits. Uh, when you look at throwing and baseball, certainly pitch limits are uh, very popular, so that's kind of accepted, but you know, for People who like to remain active, I think the most important thing is kind of know your crowd. 
You know, if you're going to play basketball and the guy is 25 year, years younger than you, then do not play that fourth pickup game because he will wear you out and you're going to get injured. And I've seen a lot of ACL injuries in, in that similar vein. Um, rest is very important. Um, I think, you know, play hard, but then you know, give yourself time to rest. Um, just as a uh, note, you know, point of uh, reference, it, when you're 50 to 60, it does take about twice as long to heal compared to a 20-year-old. And then by the time you're 80, uh, it takes three times as long. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, um, if you need to, adjust your techniques. Uh, some pe a lot of people like Zumba, some people like CrossFit, um, but they don't have that flexibility. But you know, I encourage my patients to enjoy uh, whatever they're doing, but just be safe about it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why pickleball is very popular now. It's you know, almost like playing tennis, but it's a smaller field. It's not as high impact on your body, and you're able to uh, be aerobic and stay very active. Thank you. All right.